Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, Matthew should have a good presentation about uh, telescope maintenance. I'm really looking forward to it. He's an excellent speaker, and uh, he's brave enough to take his telescope apart, like completely apart, and put it back together again, which I am not. So he knows his stuff about the insides and what you need to do. I would never take the mirror out of my telescope ever, ever. Coward. <laughs> I will admit it. I am a coward. I am not taking the mirror out of my telescope. No way. Oh, no I way. No. No. I would give it to Matthew and let him do it. Yeah. That's um, and right. I would trust him, but I would not do it myself. Matthew will take an SCT apart and put it back together. And that is something I don't have the courage to do. Oh, no. And and the, know what he's doing with it when he yeah. takes it apart, right? Like, like all correct. Getting it all oriented the right way around when he puts it yeah. back. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like taking your car apart and then having all these nuts and bolts left over on in this driveway <laughs> afterwards. It's like, yeah. oh, wow. Well. Well, they came from somewhere. It's back I hope together. I don't need them. I hope I don't need them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I'm hoping tonight I don't have to do too much running from the back of the room to the front of the room. Um, because without Doug here, I have to run from the back to the front. So you, you need to recruit someone to help you. I do. Well, he didn't expect to get into the finals, right? So you should you should um, be there cheering him on. Eh, well, I haven't been there all season to watch him play, so he'll oh, survive tonight without me. Did Besides, I your... have he's having there's a party afterwards, right? So the oh, okay. oh here we go. Here goes Bernie. I'm okay. gonna mute. Okay. Like and so anyway, I'm supposed to talk for a couple of minutes so they can check my voice levels and all that nice stuff. Is everybody here? This is the redundant question. If you can't hear me, put your hand up. If you're not listening to me, put your hand up. There you go. All right, on, on Zoom, can I just have like a thumbs up just to let me know how the sound is? Leroy, it's okay. Joanne's okay. Robert, it's okay. okay. Anne's okay. We're good. We're good. Awesome. Good evening. I'm glad to see so many of you out here on such a stupendous, stupendous day. The only good thing, the, the only reason you guys are here is you saw the clouds. Okay, that's it. And and some of you are here to see if you can take that telescope home. And I'll, I'll let you know that that telescope is going to be drawn almost at the very end of the meeting. So you're going to have to pay the piper to get through here. My name is Barney. Uh, I haven't met all of you. Some of you are new to the club. Some of you are first time attendees in the meetings, but I've been with the club for a while. If this is your first venture here, or first of a couple, let me see your hands. Oh, good, 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 good. Well, you too. Yeah, you haven't been here in ages. Uh, welcome. I'm sorry, you're going to have to sit through this. <laughs> so, let's see. Apparently, it's all done manually today, so... Oh. Oh. Get off there, Heracles. Yeah, I know. But it's, that's, I haven't got that on top of it. Yeah. So, as I said, my name is Bernie. I'm chairman of this club. We have a few council members around. Council members, just stick your hands up. These, these are the people that if you have questions, concerns, suggestions, or complaints, especially complaints, you go talk to them. Okay. I don't think you'll have very many complaints, if any at all. Um, in the way of Rooms is around the center block. Do you want to do 
for a book share program. Uh, last month we, we had a uh, virtual meeting, so we did not collect anything for the food bank. Uh, so this month I'm going to hit you for double the money. No? Okay. We tried. Uh, so far, we've got uh, a couple hundred pounds this year uh, donated to the food bank and in the neighborhood of uh, almost $200 also donated. Cash is always good for the food bank. And just because it's nice does not mean people don't need to eat. So we still need to make those donations. The, uh, let's see, what do we got back there? Our librarian. Denise is sitting back there waiting, waiting and waiting, well, she's waiting with everybody, but uh, she's waiting to get rid of some of these books or roam them around, I should say. Uh, we have a very, this is voluminous library, great range of topics. Be sure to take some time, pick a topic, something that catches your fancy, take the book home, read about it. No book report is necessary. You also have a bunch of magazines and stuff back there to get rid of, I understand, I believe. Okay, so there's lots of stuff here, like nobody should go home without something today. Right? Take a magazine home, take a book home for reading. Uh, Loner Scopes, that's our uh, all on takes care of our loaner schools. And some of you met Paula today when you signed up to become new members. Um, Paula just give a wave. There she is over there. Paula is uh, our curator for our uh, loaner scopes and equipment. And she'd be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, one of the things about the club, we, we don't want people to run out when they're just starting in the hobby. We, we don't need to run out and buy equipment. In fact, we prefer you don't. Take the time, uh, order some equipment, order different types of telescopes, see what feels best for you, and then we'll help you make a decision. Uh, let's see, where are we? Let's see for that. Um, oh, I had a very interesting day today. I've got to talk to you a little bit. I was, uh, I saw a memorial car, we were invited to a uh, science, era, I guess you might call it, uh, put on by the grade six students of Fulfill Strath Uh Sort of like a science fair, but without judging, without classes and stuff. And uh, unfortunately, Mario didn't make it. I haven't heard from him. I hope everything's okay. But uh, we had a great time. I got, I had a doctor's appointment up in the mountain earlier. And, uh, I had an opportunity just to head down to their properties and then talk to the science speaker, Mr. Hanna, and we discussed it. And, and he was quite in agreement with me calling my solar scope out of the back of the car and setting it up and letting the science students have a look see at the sun. And they really, really enjoyed it. Uh, had them in the Twelve at a time, five groups of them, and then of course after that was the fair. And I'll tell you, these kids, we've got a couple in there that I know we're going to see at base. I, I can I can sense it. They're there. You, you know they're, they're hungry. They want to know. Mm -hmm. um, I have pictures, but I don't have. I've not had an opportunity to get them on there. We'll see what we can do about posting them somewhere. But these kids, I mean, grade six, and they're anywhere from this tall to taller than me. Is it really during grade six? Yeah. Which, which, how many times is this? <laughs> but no, they're a great bunch of kids. Um, I talked also with Mr. Hanna. He's uh, looking forward to being in touch with us, talking about the education program, perhaps, uh, outreach program in the science classes. So on, but we'll talk with him about that and we'll talk about it in council as well. This is why it's programs like this that make us having people volunteer to be part of 
different programs like the outreach program and so on. Uh, so just give it some thought. Where are we? Uh, yeah, man, 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 where are you? Oh, there you are. I understand you have a little project you're working on. Give us a little talk about for a moment or two. Now we're setting up a start party up at Thackers. That's down in Long Point. Oh, Okay, we're setting up a, a start party at Bacchus. We had one last year. We had it in, I think, July. Yeah, this year we're holding it in May. We're doing it on May the 12th, and if it's a rain date, we'll go May 24 weekend. And the cost is going to be $15 per carload. So if you bring three or four people in, it's $15 per day. And you stay all night. We've had access to the swimming pool, but kind of cold for that right now. And uh, we have a very large field that you can set up a tent if you want to do a tent there. And it's all included in the $15 per day. And the more towel is a four, I mean a four. It is a world four sky. And it's a very large field, tree all around it. So you get very little city call on it. And that's what's happening on May the 12th. Any questions? Place on the internet. Pardon? It's on Facebook. Or? It's on Facebook. It's been on different sites of Facebook. Yeah. And I think it's any of us to London Rask and the Hamilton Rask. Yeah. And last year we had people from uh, Mississauga, the uh, Lake Erie uh, South Shore, North Shore group. They had a few people. So, uh, it's called Bacchus. Backus Conservation. If you're in Port Rowan, you're on the Main Street in uh, Main Street in Port Rowan, you just drive right up, go the road, touch the curve, but you continue straight through and you're going to run into Backus. And if you're coming, go to the gate and say you're there for a start party. That way you, you get the fee of $15 and you can stay the night. You can leave anytime you want. If you want to pack up at two in the morning or one, no problem. I'm there seasonal. And there's their seasonal crystal ball to be up there camping on the main field as well. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see, and while I'm staying away from the microphone, um, Sue has a couple of words for us as well. And she's going to on her up there. We should actually look at the microphone for her in a minute. We usually do, but not today. Pardon me? We usually do, but not today. So, hi everybody. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Sue McLaughlin. I'm the second chair of the uh, organization. And uh, that role entails um, many different jobs, I guess I could say. Um, so, I have a couple of announcements tonight. The first one, because there's so many new people here tonight, um, we create a calendar every year from photographs that are taken by club members. I have about six of these left, and uh, I'd be willing to sell them to you for five bucks. Um, there are some absolutely beautiful, beautiful pictures inside, many taken by a lot of people who are sitting here in the room. Um, so if you are interested, even for the beautiful pictures for January, February, March, um, there are five bucks, and I'm at the back table there. You can come and see me during the break. Okay, on to star party number two. So we have uh, a second star party um, that we organized. This one is on the Bruce Peninsula, which uh, is a site that's east of Wyerton, if you know the area at all, to go to a 50 minute drive east of Wyerton. Um, this is on a piece of private property. Uh, our club member has um, this beautiful dark sky property on the Bruce Peninsula on top of Skitter's Bluff. And he has invited us for the second year in a row to come north and camp. So um, this costs $25 per person for the weekend, $37.50 if there's an adult and a child, or $50 for a family, and that's for the people who come. 
there are no um, services on site. So this is a big open field surrounded by bush at the end of a rural road, literally at the end of the road. You cannot go any further. Um, don't laugh, don't line up. <laughs> Some of us tried that. Um, this is an observing weekend. There are no uh, lectures. It's an opportunity to come, um, meet some other members in the club, set up your astrophotography equipment, set up your telescope, um, enjoy the camaraderie of uh, other uh, amateur astronomers in a dark sky location. We do a buffet Chinese dinner on Saturday night. That's a group thing, but you can bring your own food. You don't have to do the Chinese food. Um, we have portable washrooms on site. Um, there's no running water. There are no showers, um, but everyone's not having a shower, so it's okay. Uh, we will have a generator on site going for charging astronomy equipment, should the need be. And um, if you don't want to stay on site in a tent or in a trailer, there are lots and lots of motels, B&Bs, et cetera, close by. And it is a wonderful weekend, and I don't do this by myself. Matthew and Janice Mannery are part of the planning committee, as well as my husband, Beth Turner. So, um, with that committee, we uh, do this. You can contact me at starparty at amateurastronomy.org for questions about the star party. And there's lots of information on our website. If you click on HAA 2023 uh, Dark Sky Star Party, you'll get a drop down. Tons of information is there, including the registration form and the instructions for payment as well. If anybody has any questions, um, I can take them now, or you can come as near the break. Do we have any questions? Uh, do you know how long will be registered? Hands up. <laughs> you better be. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing the low. Yeah, we have right now, as of last count, there are 16 individuals who have registered, and um, some trailers and some, and some tent and motor home. Um, it'll hold a lot of people. Um, if it gets to the point where we are getting full, I will make sure that the registration page is taken down. But right now we've got lots of space, lots of space. And it's in September, I didn't say that. September 22nd, which is a Friday to the Monday of the 25th. You can stay one night, two nights, three nights. The choice is up to you. So, yeah, it's an it's an awesome. We had an awesome time. That's true. So yes. In close to this one today, 360 days. <coughs> you remember back a couple of years ago, after 2017, I threw a little placard showing 4,000 some odd days? Well, there we are, folks. It's getting close. It's going to come up and bite us before you know it. Or maybe it bite the sun. Um, we are trying to get a lot of attention that you talked about this part, too. Okay. So the solar eclipse is going right over Hamilton, the edge of it is. We will have approximately a minute and three quarters ish of um, complete darkness. It's not as much as if you were in like the very center because we're up on the edge, but um, it's still quite a bit of time. And so council has been talking about how we handle this event and what um, we are potentially planning on doing in a year from now. So what, what our plan is, is to have um, club members um, man various sites around the city and around the area with a telescope or binoculars or cooked glasses, something where the public can actually come and view the eclipse. So in order to do that, um, it's going to take um, a concerted effort amongst a lot of the members of the club to actually pull this off, um, if that's what we're going to do. So that's kind of the plan for the day. 
is to have that. Now, if it's cloudy, everybody stays home and they'll leave it in, right? So, um, and it's April, we've got a 60 40 chance of that. But that's kind of what we want to do to provide the public with those opportunities, which is what our um, goals of the organization are is that education and public outreach. And so that's what we want to try for the day up. Now, um, leading up to the eclipse, so in the next year, um, we're looking at potential partnerships with other clubs, organizations, um, school boards, McMaster, Hillfield, et cetera. Um, we're looking at the potential of having uh, member workshops as well for making you know, cameras, making solar filters, um, those types of things, even how you set up and handle a large crowd coming to work through telescopes and what needs to be done. We're also looking at public education and outreach, and Joanne Salchi, of course, will be looking after that for the requests that come in for the children's part of it. We're also looking at, are we going to expand into adult, et cetera? And then Mario Carr uh, looks after all of our marketing and PR. There will need to be work done with that as well. Um, we also have to talk to the city of Hamilton as well for setting up. So there's a whole bunch of pieces that need to be put together for us to pull this off. Now, council can't do that. There's not enough of us on council to actually do all that. <laughs> so um, you have a volunteer opportunity. You have a couple of them. And the first volunteer opportunity is to sit on the planning committee um, that would plan out the events would be responsible for getting the thoughts of council into the action piece. So we've got kind of the broad plan, but now we need a group of people who are willing to do that to plan this event, all right? This is probably a year commitment. Now, you're not going to meet every day all year, but it can't be. It won't go more than a year. We can run through this. It's kind of done, right? So it's a, it would be a year commitment to look after this. And the other part of this we need is we also need volunteers who would actually be willing to go out um, on the day of the eclipse to man the stations where um, we would potentially have public coming to view the eclipse. Now, when the eclipse was here in 2017, even though it wasn't a total eclipse, it was partial, um, there were a lot of people that did show up at the kind of impromptu sites that we did have at that point in time. But we're looking at making this a little more formal. So if you are interested in sitting on the planning committee, then please come and speak to me. If you are interested in, in volunteering your time on the day of, we will get to that later on because right now we're just in the planning stages for that. And I will be very honest, if we don't get the um, membership to help with this, we can't do it. Um, there's just not about enough of us on, on council that can actually do all of this work. We can't do it. So we need your help. And I'll be honest, if we find the membership isn't interested in this, then unfortunately we won't be able to pull it off um, because we need more help than just us on council. So if you are interested, you can contact me. It's a different email for the star party. It's secondchairamateurastronomer.org. I'd like to keep both separate because I get too confused with what's that. All of it coming into one. I have the proposal that was written um, for council. I will share that with you if you're interested in reading through it. So I'm just giving you the Cole's notes here. So if you're interested in reading through it and then you want to make the decision, that's perfectly fine. Um, so if you want to contact me, that's fine. And you can speak to me during the break. Tonight, Council Work, if you have any further questions. So that's where we're at. We're at the beginning, we're at the planning stages, and we're looking for volunteers to help with the planning committee as well as on the day. Okay, don't want to take time for questions now, but I will definitely field questions at the back during, during the break. And I think I'm done. Well, the only thing that I would like to add to that is there will not ever be a circumstance where we ask you to go out with a uh, group that we don't know by yourself. That will not happen. We will out and either be tuned up or uh, trioed up, or depending on where you are, you might even be four. Depends how many people we have and how many sites we have. Uh, 
2017 she, she was referring to a lot of people went down south and got rained on or clouded out sorry uh but myself and a few people uh, uh who did denise and brenda and a couple others a couple of others showed up at mcquestion park and we had something like 1700 people come through that was quite a day, I'll tell you. That was a learning experience. Pardon me? Oh, and Robert, yes, Robert, yes. And I still say thank you, Robert, for bringing that case of water. <laughs> that's that's something to be remembered. Um, yeah, so it's fun. You meet a lot of people. You're going to have, most likely, uh, the, the eclipse is at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. or. or the main part of it is around that time, begins around that time. Uh, you'll be set up most likely a couple hours before. I, I would strongly suggest that because you'll have, uh, thank you, pardon Don't move my head. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, Yeah, so, so I, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. The train just left the station without me. Setting up early. Oh, setting up early. Yes, because we're still we're still in a, a very active sunspot site. So a lot of people will be interested to see that as well. And you're not going to get, you know, 1,100 people or 200 people even through into your school. And in fact, during the actual eclipse, from contact to end contact, nobody's looking in my school. I am, yeah. right? Up till the eclipse begins, or, or yeah, we'll pass first contact, maybe. People are welcome. I'll explain stuff to them, this, that, and other thing, but when it's time, it's my time. You can look again after. But that's what the solar glasses are for, that's what all of that is. Anyway, oh, I see a hand. You want to say something? Speak. Yeah. Nobody looks at the sun because it's so bright. Right? So let's pretend we're at that eight or the cliff. You're part of the group that's showing a number of people, young people, older people, um, that there's an eclipse. Everything will be fine until if you just close your eyes for a moment and think when the eclipse is on, the sun is hidden behind the moon. But there is nothing more dangerous in astronomy than the moment that the sun appears yeah. after the total part of the eclipse. Is over. And in that few seconds, what will all these people and children that be doing? Will they be looking for something safe? Because they won't have seen anything if they've been looking through those glasses while the eclipse was gone. But if they are looking in the direction of the sun, when even a sliver of it becomes available, they'll be blind. So I'd like you to keep that in mind because this is perhaps the most dangerous, potentially libelous problem that you can have in a storm is a solar eclipse. That's very correct. Um, having been in touch with clubs that uh, observed the total eclipse in 2017, uh, the, the protocol seems to be that you have a whistle or some such loud device that uh, once you get hit totality, you sound the whistle, and 10 seconds before the end of totality, you sound the whistle again. Other than that, there's not much else we can do. We can't physically take people's eyes away from it, but we can do what we can do. And that's all part of the planning and, and so on and so forth. Okay, where are we? 
Did I skip a page? Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, things coming up in the near future. Um, next Saturday is uh, observing out of Denbrook. Those of you who don't know where it is, uh, you'll get the information in the, uh, in the email. Um, then we have on the 29th out of Bayfront a mixed outreach. So, what that is, is uh, some solar observing between two o'clock and four o'clock or thereabouts. And then in the evening, we'll tackle some celestial view. On this May the 7th at Lakeland Park is going to be a hopefully a nice, bright, clear day for some solar observing. You're going to see that um, within the next 10 or 11 months, I'm going to be trying to get as many solar events as we can because it's, it's time to start teaching people and distributing glasses and so on and so forth. Speaking of which, everybody in the club will get a pair of glasses. Because you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to buy them. They've got them for you. On um, May the 12th, is membership back here. Our speaker there or for that will be Alan Dyer. Uh, some of you know who he is. He is uh, uh, Terry Dickinson's co-author of Night Watch. So he's... he's Reasonably well known. Uh, and then uh, the following months, we're back out of Denbrook on a new moon on a Saturday. So, so and if it rains, we're back in on the, uh, go back on the 20, the next day, hopefully. Okay. Now, I think it's almost time for me to start talking. Oh, you jumped. Where are you? We lost Matthew. Matthew's in here for you. Matthew, I took things out of ways for you. Yes, John. Once again, may I ask if you plug your 101? Certainly. Thank you. Didn't make it for the list. <laughs> it's, it's, it's written here. It's written here. <laughs> things, things that I forgot to say, or things that I forgot to write. Uh, John, of course, of course, John. I'm so sorry. Uh, John Goldgrove. Past chair, past uh, observing director is the anchor of the uh, Astronomy 101. Uh, Astronomy 101 is not a technical program. It's not the 101 that you would get in university. 101 here is in, well, there are no capital numbers, but it's a where we do small numbers. Okay. Um, Maybe we should just call it C1, you know, 101. Um, John and uh, a whole bunch of other speakers get together every couple of weeks, uh, usually on a Friday, always on a Friday, and uh, discuss a topic that's near and dear to the speaker and is valuable information for beginners. And not only beginners. Um, what else can I say about it? Please do. <laughs> it's it's very casual. It's very friendly. It's aimed at absolute beginners. Everybody is welcome. It's all done online. If you're interested, I'll gladly put it on the email list. Come in and, and join in. It's not like stand up front, sit and listen. It's very participatory. Everybody chats, has a good time. So, and everybody's welcome. Aimed at beginners. There thank you. Go. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, John. Okay, now. We'll move to the next chair. Oh, yes, empty. And then the next one, that's Matthew, Matthew Mannering, uh, our most recent uh, iteration of observing director. Yes. X. <laughs> yes, you can. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, so family in Brantford, the husband passed away a while ago, and I was asked to go help uh, figure out the value of all the astronomy here that they had. And they asked what they should do with this one scope. And I mentioned that I would be able to give it away at the club as, as a, a prize, and they were happy to donate it to the club. 
Um, it's a Russian-made scope from around 1998-99. It has very nice glass in it. It has an actual barlow right in the focuser, which normally means that it's a junk scope that was made by somebody more in China more and more recently. But the glass in the barlow is excellent. It's all really good. Even the finder is really top-notch on it and scopeable. I forgot a piece. I'm going to show you which piece I forgot. And that's after we already made one extra trip back to Brantford because I brought another piece. <laughs> so that little knot that tightens the uh, mount head to the uh, to the pier is somewhere on the carpet by my front door. Anyway. I will get that to whomever wins the scope, no problem. I, that's why the scope is not on the mount right now, because I don't want the thing to tip over. That would be bad. Uh, I've included an eyepiece with it. It has a single drive motor, so you plug it in, and it will track with the stars as long as you over align it first. Again, nice glass in it, perfectly usable scope. Uh, it was a nice gift to the club, and that's, that's it. Okay. You probably are up next anyway. Thank you. Um, no, that, that's a, yeah, you're, you're, you're still in there. She stuck that stuff in. So, yes, on telescope <laughs> care and maintenance. Yes. That is what you're going to speak to us about. I will go part of it and then take it all as well as All right. Thank you. Oh, that's not the way I want that to appear. But I just have presenter mode, Sue. Is it? Oh, okay. Well, as long as it's good up there, I'm all right. But she's coming anyway. <laughs> I've seen this before, but I know. Right. Okay, that's fine. Okay, thanks, Sue. Okay, so tonight I'm going to cover telescope maintenance and collimation. Um, I'm only going to deal with parts of all of this that I have done that I'm familiar with. Types of telescopes I ripped apart and rebuilt, collimation on scopes that I've done myself. So if there is anything that's not covered in here, number one, it would make it way too long. And number two, I don't know anything about it. So I'm not going to talk about stuff I don't know about. Uh, by the way, I just thought that's sort of one of the ultimate in telescope maintenance and collimation going on there with the Hubble. And the actual shuttle involved there is, is Atlantis. Okay. Okay, so in general, should you attempt whatever maintenance you're contemplating? Basically, before you even touch any tools, decide on if it's something you're willing to tackle. If tools make you nervous and really you're just using hand tools, then you know, get a buddy who's better with tools than you are to help you. But really, there's really nothing in terms of tools that's that complicated to, to have. Um, I'm going to discuss maintenance by type, and I'm going to have some bonus slides at the end, which have nothing to do with any. <laughs> so like I said, are you comfortable with the tools you're going to need? Uh, the best way really to describe it is we need Allen keys, we need screwdrivers, we're going to need a wrench maybe, um, some little vice tools, vice grips, things like that. Nothing really crazy. You need a big flat work surface, big table. And remember, the bigger the telescope, the bigger the surface that you need, or it could space on the floor that's got nothing else on it. But you need a nice flat surface to, to use to work on. If you're going to try something other than very basic maintenance, can you afford to replace it if you break it? So if you drop it or whatever, are you willing to take that risk and maybe? lose the scope. So um, that's also something to contemplate and another reason to have another person with another set of hands and eyes. 
<laughs> you could blame them, but they might not appreciate it. Um, another way you can start is if you have a cheap scope, like an old Sears refractor or, or whatever, something that's basically not in very good shape to start, then whatever you work, you attempt on it, you can't really probably hurt it, right? If somebody wants, says, I've got this old scope, I don't know what to do with it, it doesn't work, you can say, well, I'll take that and I'll rip it apart and see if I can put it back together. There's there's ways to do this so that uh, you lessen the risk. So you need the tools. There are resources you can uh, get in terms of things like YouTube videos, articles in magazines. There's information you can get. And quite often there's information about your exact scope, about how somebody has already ripped it apart, cleaned it, put it back together, make it work just as good or better than new. Plan what you're going to do. If all you're going to do is wipe down the scope, you don't need much of a plan, right? But if you're going to take all the optics out of the tube, for instance, of an SCT, perhaps you should know every step that you need to do before you do it. Uh, and don't be afraid to document, even if it's just rough notes in your own little notebook. Who cares? Make sure you have that available. Yes, if you use your cell phone to take pictures as you go, that's always a big help. I've actually done that as well. Uh, like I say, YouTube YouTube videos are awesome. Uh, before I worked on my first SCP, when I ripped it apart, I really didn't know what I was doing, so I watched a whole bunch of YouTube videos, and it was very helpful. And look at the tools that the people use who do the job on the YouTube video. Did the tools they used, did they actually, were they the correct tools? Or they were like using a hammer when maybe they should have been using a little screwdriver. You know, like, I'm really exaggerating, but you get the idea. Sometimes people make do with certain tools and make do around optics is bad. They'll spend a few bucks on the right tools if you need them rather than making do. Um, accessories, yes, accessories come in the form of things like pillows and blankets and towels and all sorts of stuff, right? Pillows to put underneath your primary before you take it out of the tube. So if you have a 30 pound primary and all of a sudden it drops out as you take all the screws out, it's better it lands on the pillow than on the floor. That would be bad. Lens cleaning cloths, uh, lots of them have lots of them. You can buy them at Walmart. If you're like me, I just go to the optometrist and say, please, 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 can I have a couple of extra ones? And they throw them at you. So it's all good, right? Keep those in reserve, and when they're dirty, you can throw them in the laundry and wash them and come up just as good as new. Keep your rags and your lens cloths separate. So anything you're going to use to clean mechanical parts, keep well away from the cloths that you're going to use to clean your optics. Bad things can and probably will happen. So you can drop things. You can lose little parts. You can crack, break. And you can reassemble it incorrectly so that it won't work at all. Um, but this is why I say start with a scope you don't really care about too much or that you're willing to take a chance with, uh, especially if your intention is to do more than one over time. Uh, success, success is great. It either is as good as it was, or worse, or it works just as good as new, right? So be prepared though that no matter how hard you try things, go wrong. Okay, do nots. Now, this is my own opinion. Everybody's do not list is going to be entirely different. This is my do not. Do not take eyepieces apart, ever. They're even in the simplest eyepiece that you can see up there. There's a couple of different lenses in it. Get into anything more complicated, you can have seven or eight lenses in there. If you put them in the wrong way around or in the incorrect order, it's going to be going back to the factory to get fixed if that's even possible. When you're working with eyepieces, you just want to clean the top surface, the bottom surface, if you can get to it easily, and you want to leave it alone. If you have a really expensive Apple Comat triplet refractor, please don't take the cell apart, take the, the lenses out. Just, just don't. Uh, clean the front surface. If you really need to, clean the back surface. Of the lenses in the cell, but don't take it apart because really expensive apples. Some of them, the spacing is done with oil, 
And in the other cases, it's done with little tiny thin spacers. Uh, if you've got an acromat, a, a much cheaper refractor, then sure, if it's an old one, give it a go, right? But don't don't take apart triplet at five thousand dollar you know lens cells. And again, don't use the same cloths to clean the mechanicals and then paint the lenses or the mirror. Just just make sure everything is kept nice and separate. So let's start with Newtonians. So Newtonians are the type we normally see them on dot mounts these days. The primary mirror is there at the bottom of the tube. The secondary mirror is up near where the focuser is near the top. And that secondary mirror deflects the light across and out through the focuser to the eyepiece. So what are the things that you're generally going to do? And a lot of this holds for any scope. You're going to wipe the whole scope down every once in a while, just keep the dust and grit off of it and the, the pollution that inevitably just settles out of the air. Um, if it's three o'clock in the morning and your scope is covered with dew and you're just beat, most of us just take the scope, any eyepieces in the mountain, we throw it all in the boxes and we go to bed. But you have to get up early the next day and open everything up to the sunlight or to the warmth and let everything dry out. Don't leave anything stored long-term because you'll get mold in the telescope, on the lenses, on the mirrors, and mold loves coatings on mirrors and on lenses and actually etches right into the coatings, not good. So always make sure your optics are dry, your little telescope, mount everything. Extend the focus route, sometimes all the way out, just wipe the focuser uh, tube so that when you don't have grit going in and out, in and out, right? You don't want that. No matter how good your focuser is, uh, eventually it will start to, to wear, to loosen, and you'll be trying to put a, an eyepiece in there, a fairly heavy one, and you'll be turning the knob and nothing happens. So you do have to be able to know how to adjust the resistance on the focuser at some point. For almost any focuser out there, there are YouTube videos and articles on Bobby Knights, places like that, that will tell you which of those little screws to adjust and which ones not to touch. So just follow what it says, make very small incremental changes. I say this about a lot of things to do with telescope maintenance, small changes, incremental. As soon as you get what you need, you don't tighten anything anymore or loosen anything anymore. You just want it just, just so like the porridge. Um, if you have a dog, take the dog base apart once in a while. If it starts squeaking like a, you know, like a bunch of field mice are in there. Maybe take it apart. Some of the bigger bases are heavy. Uh, get somebody to give you a hand if you want. There might be a uh, platter in there with some bearings in it. Just put some oil in there, put it back together. You're done. It's not just usually one bolt holds the whole thing together. Uh, clean mirror surfaces or, or objectives, any kind of lenses, probably at most once a year. Uh, if you use your scope a lot and it gets that film of pollution on it, you might have to do it two times a year. Don't clean the optics more than you have to, but don't be scared to clean them either. You just have to show the appropriate care. Newtonians, 50% or more to me of the maintenance is collimation. And that's especially if you have a big dog. Because if you can imagine, you put your 12 inch dog in the back of your car, and you take it to an observing site and it's bouncing in the back seat, right? And that 30 pound mirror is just, you know, having a great time back there. And by the time you get there, your collimation is, you know, the telescope to the, the mirror's in. Anyway, uh, to keep it friendly. Um, so we're gonna be doing collimation on the bigger scopes. Smaller uh, Newtonians, they hold their collimation a lot longer. So let's start with cleaning the primary on a Newtonian. You're going to get a pillow or whatever. You're going to put it under where the back of the telescope is. The mirror at the back, the big primary mirror, is held in a cell, and the cell has screws that go through the tube into the cell all the way around. You're going to take those screws out, and you're gently going to pull that cell out with the mirror in it. Now, a lot of people will tell you, you have to take the mirror out of the cell to wash the mirror. I never have. I do it with the cell and everything. And I put it into the uh, sink in a, in a 
a fish strainer put on an angle. I rinse it heavily. Then I get some uh, mild soap, like dish soap, and I rub the mirror. Now, the nice thing about your fingertips is they're very sensitive. If you feel any kind of grit, you stop and just rinse the whole thing, get that grit off, rinse your fingers off, and then start with the soap again. And then do it two or three times until that mirror looks all sparkly clean. Now, before the water can dry on it, get a bucket of distilled water or a bottle of it and just run it over the mirror, okay? Because you don't want any minerals settling on the mirror surface. You can use, uh, if there's any drips left, you can use like a little tissue to, to dab it off, or you can uh, use a hair dryer on low and appropriately far enough away that you don't do any heat damage to the mirror. You're just trying to blow the water in droplets off. That's the way I do it, but just use common sense. The secondary is that little mirror that makes the light go into the focuser. These um, tend to get more pollution on them, the film of nastiness that you see every once in a while. And they also get dew on them more because they're at the top of the tube. When you're not using the secondary, I have a little drawstring bag that I got from who knows what. I don't know. Don't even remember it so long ago. But I got a drawstring bag that fits right over the secondary. I just cinch it. And that's how I store the, the, the uh, mirror so that it doesn't get dust and dirt and stuff on it in between uses. Uh, if you're going to clean it, again, clean lens cloths. Lots of lens solution that you use on your glasses, that works fine for this, but make sure that you're not rubbing a, rubbing a, a dry cloth right on there. Make sure it's nice and wet and very gentle, clean it off, and only do it if you really need to. Don't over clean. And then you get to collimation on Newtonians. That's the thing that a lot of people struggle with. So like I said, big Newtonians require collimation almost every time you set up. Smaller ones, eight inch and less, if they're done with push pull screws, uh, they tend to hold themselves in place quite nicely and the mirrors are a lot lighter. You don't have to do it as often, but you still need to just check it. Um, in my opinion, a good laser collimator is worth its weight in gold. I use one all the time. I know how to do it manually, I hate it, uh, but I do know how to do it manually. But a good laser collimator, one that, where the laser itself is collimated, is a good so a lot of older scopes don't have a center spot. I don't know why, but I run into this about three times now with older scopes where the mirror isn't center spotted. And, and really, if you want to do pollination with a laser, you really kind of need a center spot to do it properly. So how do you go about doing that? First of all, you clean your mirror. Because the next thing you're going to do is get a piece of white paper on a hard surface. And you're going to put the mirror face down very gently onto that very clean piece of white paper. And then you're going to draw a circle around the mirror. Okay, move the mirror off to a safe place, cut out that circle. Fold it into four pieces. So over and over and automatically you've got a crosshair type fold at the dead center of your circle. Put a pin through it. Now you have the hole. Now you put your mirror in front of you, face up, put the paper on it, center it exactly, you can just with a magic marker, place it over the pinhole so you leave a little tiny black dot dead center on the mirror. This is the easiest way to do this. No measuring, no tools, no nothing. You just have to hold the paper in four and put a pin through it. Once you've done that, you know those little um, reinforcement little circles that we used to put on the paper that went into dual tanks. You go to Staples and buy a little box of 250 of those and you use one. So, <laughs> so it seems a bit redundant, but that's the way you have to buy them, right? You put that so that that makes like a donut right around that little black dot and you now have a perfectly done um, center dotted primary, and that, that little sucker will stay on there through multiple, multiple washes. It's amazing. Stay on. So that's good. You just have to do it once. Now, the actual collimation itself. You're going to begin with the secondary. 
The secondary is that mirror that's on an angle, 45 degree angle. And from the front, you'll see that there is the, the, the veins that hold the secondary to the tube. They come out, there's four veins. And on the tube itself, there's four knobs. The first thing you should do, in fact, you should do it every time you get your scope out, is give those knobs a little tweak and tighten the veins so that everything is tight. Because if you're going to adjust the secondary and that's loose, then all you're doing is hold things wobbling in there, maybe a, a tiny amount, but that's all you need to ruin your secondary collimation. So just tighten it up. Most of the time, you have to use tiny little screwdrivers or little Allen keys to get the very tiny little screws, which are in the top of the secondary here. You can see in the top of the secondary, there's three little holes around the edge, and there's one big bolt in the middle, right? The three little holes, that's how you align the secondary. So there's something called Bob's knobs, and they are available for most telescopes. They are ridiculously priced little knobs, but a lot of people love them because you take those little screws out of your secondary screws, you put these in, and then all your adjustments are done just like this. Way easier, less things to drop down the tube, by the way, don't do all this with everything set up so gravity will take anything you drop and let it fly right down the tube onto the primary. Again, bad, right? So there's two ways to do all this collimation. You can do it visually with a, a little tool like this, or you can do it uh, with the uh, laser. Now, when you buy one of these collimation tools, it will come with a really beautifully written two-page thing with an absolutely horrible diagram on it that will look like that or in something like that. I hate these diagrams. I hate them with a passion. You have to figure out how to interpret them. And the way you do that is you look down the, the pollinator and you look in there and you try and figure out what part of what you're looking at fits with what parts on that diagram are really dislike this. Other people have no trouble with this whatsoever. That's that's just how your brain works. Mine doesn't work that way. So there's two common problems with the secondary where I do use this pollination tool. One is if somebody else has had this scope, they may have played around with it. In fact, there's a good chance they played around with everything. And the secondary is on a bolt, a threaded bolt that you can see to the right of the secondary there going out of the picture. So that the secondary is threaded on there. If it's not centered in the focuser hole, you need to loosen that hole and then run the secondary like this in or out until it is centered underneath the focuser. Uh, that's really important. As soon as you've got it centered, tighten the bolt. Whichever type it has, there's various ways, but tighten the bolt and lead it. The other problem is, is that it could be centered, but it could be pointing nowhere near a hole where the focuser is. And I've seen that several times now in the last few years where something either came incorrectly made from the factory or somebody else has played with it and left it pointing towards Utah instead of towards the focuser. So what you wanna do is while you've got the bolt loose, is make sure that the secondary mirror is flat when you look down on it it should look flat right back at you. If it's pointed away, rotated away, then you need to turn it and retighten everything. Needless to say, don't spin that secondary so many times that it falls off the end of the bolt. Again, that's not good. So once, um, yeah, hang on a second. Oops. Okay, so once you've do, done that, assuming you're doing it as um, just a visual um, type of, of method rather than using a, a laser, you're going to move to the back of the telescope, and that's where your collimation and lock uh, knobs are. You're either going to see three sets of two screws, and those are push pull. So each one, each set pushes against the um, the mirror or, or against the cell, and the other one pulls. So you can make the whole thing kind of tip. And the other method is, is that three of those, the thin screw heads on this one, are just lock knobs, and the big fat ones 
are your actual collimation knobs. Push-pull bolts collimation generally much better. These you have to adjust more often. And the thing to remember with the locking knobs, the smaller ones, is if you tighten them up nice and tight, all your collimation you just did is just wrecked. You just want to put them to, just like just touch and stop. And you're done that part. Now, to collimate the primary, you're going to stick a nice high power eyepiece in the, in the focuser. You're going to aim at a really nice bright star and you're going to deliberately defocus it way out of focus. And what you should see is that diagram on the left, some nice concentric rings. If you don't, if it looks like the one on the right, it means that your primary is tilted correctly. And what you do is you go back and forth between the high piece in the back, or you do it with a buddy, and you work the little knobs until you get concentric rings. Once you do that, you, you stop, you're done. Okay. So that's sort of how you're going to pollinate that way. If you have a laser, be aware there's two types of lasers. There's ones that are really good, and there's ones that aren't. Generally, $70, $60 lasers work, but they're not very good because quite often the laser itself, which is supposed to collimate your scope, isn't collimated. It's out of alignment. In fact, I had one that was um, about a quarter of an inch at four feet out of alignment. So it was making like a half inch or, or a bigger circle on the wall. So depending on which way I put it in, it would change where I thought the center was. You can collimate these, but that's a whole different talk. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but let's assume that it's all good. On the laser, you'll see there's a target, and you can actually see a, a laser dot on there. That's a reflection of the laser going down, hitting the mirrors, coming back up, and landing on that surface. Now, remember that center spot you put on the primary? This is where it comes in awesome. You just uh, play with the secondary screws until the laser beam on the primary is right in the center of the donut you put on there. Once that's done, that secondary is collimated. It's good as far as you're concerned. You've already checked it where it's placed within the tube, whether it's angled correctly now, you can change the collimation so that it literally bounces that laser straight down to the center. And you move on to the primary here. So you move to the back of the scope, your laser is still in the, in the focuser, and you have that target pointed back towards you at the back of the scope. And if everything's good, you should see that laser somewhere on the target. That means you're close. And what you're going to do is just adjust the knobs on the laser, goes into the little black hole in the center, and you're done. If it's nowhere there, you've got a slightly bigger problem. It means your primary is pointed off that way, that way, whatever. It's not pointed at the secondary. So that's where Buddy really comes in helpful because uh, you need to kind of figure out where it is in that space around the secondary, and then you need to move the knobs until you draw it back to the secondary, and then you can fine tune it. Uh, not really difficult to do, you just have to be aware it can happen. So you can also buy what's called a Barlow laser. This is like taking it to the second step where you're going to get a super, super duper um, collimation on the scope. You'll get fantastic images. Barlow lasers are more expensive. In this particular case, the Barlow is that little silver disc that you can see. So you can do some of this with just the laser, and then you screw on that disc, and you put it back into the focuser. And instead of getting that little dot on the target, you get uh, a shadow of the donut that you put on the primary. That's what you're actually seeing. And what you do is you just adjust the knobs until that donut goes exactly around the center hole on your target, like in the right hand picture there. And you're done. And man, is it ever accurate. And I love my laser. I do. I have one that looks just like this one. It's a Kendrick. They don't make them anymore. But uh, to me, it takes this whole process and it takes it from 15 minutes down to about 45 seconds or a minute. And I'm done. So more time to observe. Refractor maintenance. I'm doing refractors and SCPs. I'm going as fast as I can. 
So a lot of it in general is the same. Wipe the scope down, clean the focuser tube. If you have dew inside the telescope, which you normally see on the inside front lens surface, take the um, plug you have in the focuser out, let the whole thing just dry in the warmth or in the house or wherever until there's no moisture left in the tube. Again, uh, moisture for a long time means mold, mold means bad news. Um, only clean the lenses if you need to, right? Eventually, like on my five inch one day, I was looking in the front and I noticed there was this horrible blue film over the whole thing. And I, I cleaned it. You just clean it carefully, blow off any dust, grit first with a blue camel hair brush or something very gently, and then use some lens cleaner and a really like damp uh, lens cloth and just gently wipe it down. You don't know, use any more pressure than, than you need to. And like I said before, don't worry about dust specks on the inside surface, on the, in on the inner lens. It doesn't matter, you can't see it anyway. Now, if you're gonna collimate a refractor, how many here have collimated a refractor? Yeah, a couple of us, right? And, and, and me too. So I, I got this particular scope uh, from the star party for cheap. It was a stellar view though, nice one. And it was totally miscollimated. So I thought, okay, here's my chance to learn on a, on a refractor. Um, it was, it's an acromat, airspace doublet. It's about as basic as it gets in that respect. For about 15 or 20 bucks, you buy this little collimating cap. It's even shorter than the one for Newtonians. You take out the crosshairs at the front. You don't really need those in there. And then you just use the rest of it. Now, some lens cells with the, with the lenses in it, they can't be collimated because they've cemented everything together. And then they pressed it into the cell. And that is that. So you just clean the front and back surfaces. If that's not enough, then I don't know what to say. I had a set like that happen. And I gave the scope away to somebody who told them why I gave it to them. Um, if you notice on some cells, there's adjustment screws right around the lens itself. The objective in front, there's sets of push pull screws right there. I have not done that type of collimation. It basically, I think, affects tilt. So I can't really say anything about that. I have no clue. But what I have done is adjust for centering like this, right? So the two lenses are, are one right in front of the other. So on that telescope there, I wish I had pointed, but I don't. You'll see on the cell, there are two little holes and there's three sets of those all the way around. And one of them is for the front lens element and the one behind it is for the back lens element, all right? What you want to do basically is work with one lens if you can and leave the other alone. That didn't work out for me, but it might for you. So what you do is in the house, you put the collimating cap in the focuser, you have no diagonals, anything like that. You point it at a nice bright wall, just a plain painted wall would be best. Um, and then you look through the cap and if everything's beautiful, then what you'll see is the ghost of two donuts, one right on top of the other. It'll look like one donut, really, but it's just like a ghostly image in the center of your field of view. If it's not collimated properly, you're going to get two donuts that are overlapped, like in the other part of the picture. And what you do is you adjust those little screws in very tiny amounts. One goes in, the other ones come out. You know, some go out, the other one goes in. And you just want to merge those two donuts into one. If you can't do it with the one lens, which is what happened to me, what I did was I just overall tried to center that lens by adjusting all the screws until they're even. And then I worked on the other lens and within five minutes it was done. And the scope is like new. It's, it's a fantastic scope, super sharp. Um, but again, stick with just uh, scopes that you don't worry too much about if something goes horribly wrong. SETs, SNCC grains. 
basically the general maintenance is the same as for in a lot of ways as a refractor because that front plate corrector plate that's actually a meniscus on this one but don't worry about it the front plate uh, you're going to treat it like you would any other uh glass lens type surface the thing i found though which is weird is i've done three of these and uh lens glass cleaner streaks it doesn't work for whatever the, the coatings are on those things, it doesn't work. So, and what water worked better for me, yes. I was going to mention at least cell telescopes, so as well, stay away from anything that's for cleaning glasses because it tends to have silicone in it, and that's probably what was streaking. And that, yeah, Once you get lens feed like for old fashioned cameras. Uh, that, that, that works. That works. Yes, and that's what I found. And I was kind of confused a bit about that. I didn't, didn't really look it up, but yeah, it was like, how come it works just on the lenses on my on feedback here? How come it uh, works better that way on some things, but definitely on correct or place it just didn't work. So I just use. Um, Cloths that are look like like very gently got a bit of soap in them, and I just sort of damp clean it. Yes. You could ask your wife to give you uh, a few of her cotton balls. Put the cotton ball into a little bit of distilled water, and just run that in this world. If you feel that you have to clean the exterior of the lens on my telescope. Right, but just make sure that it's real cotton and not synthetic cotton balls, because synthetic cotton balls will scratch the, any of the any lens surface or mirror even worse. Um, so I don't like to mention those too much because if you pick up the wrong kind of cotton balls, you are going to damage your equipment. If you do are going to use cotton balls, make sure it's real cotton. It has to stay right on the package. What else? So here's kind of a weird thing. Yes. Well, the corrector is a pretty big, pretty big piece of glass to use the lens pen. Oh, I I have tried that. If you have a fresh pen, I would say, yeah, that, that works. I just find the ones that I've bought, most of them are dried out within a short period. So I just tend to go more old school than, than that. But lens pens will work for small areas if it's a fresh pen and there's still enough um, liquid in, in the end of it. So here's a weird thing about SCTs. I found out I was cleaning a friend of mine, Jim's SCT, and I was storing it face down on the carpet so that it was safe. I didn't have the case for it at that time. And I was reading online about feather touch focusers. And feather touch makes beautiful focusers for every type of telescope, right? They're, they're top notch. But if you have bought somebody else's older SCT with a feather touch on it, be aware that they made a bunch of these things over a few years where eventually the internals of the focuser loosen up. And then it literally just one day lets go. And when it lets go, the primary mirror will fall directly onto the corrector and everything is smashed and you are done. So if you have a scope with a feather touch focuser on it, what I did immediately was, number one, I tipped it on its side because I was about to have a bird. And number two is I took the focuser off and found out that it was a more modern version of it and everything was tight inside, it was all good. But if you're buying an older SCT and it has a feather touch, I would go into cloudy nights and I would find out if it's the one where everything can fall apart. In the meantime, don't store it, correct your plate down on the floor. Okay, so SCT collimation, this is the last part of this. Um, this is actually fairly straightforward. Um, you have your Bob's knobs hopefully on the front. What you do is you put your scope onto a mount. Um, if, you, if you're gonna put it on a tracking mount, just put it onto a bright star, center it dead nuts in the middle of the field of view and just let it track. 
Otherwise, if you just have an old all paths mount, you can actually just point it at Polaris. Polaris will move. So this is great because you know you don't have to keep adjusting it too much. Now, put a really high, high uh, magnification eyepiece in there. Defocus the image the same as you would have on your Newtonian. And you should see beautiful concentric rings like at the top. If it's out of collimation, it will look like the middle one. If it looks like the bottom, go have a coffee or whatever. <laughs> because the atmosphere is really bad. You're not, or the scope isn't acclimatized. It's not at temperature. Either way, you're not doing anything, right? So, you know, go have a drink, watch, show on TV, read a book, I don't care. Come back in an hour uh, and then see if you've got rings, have some description at least. But if it looks like the bottom, either wait, see if it settles down or just wait for another night. Let's assume you've got some rings like in the middle picture. So here's something that's really, really important. Every time you make an adjustment to those secondary screws, you will actually watch the star move in the field of view. If you're looking through the eyepiece, it's going to move. After you finish turning the knob, you have to move it back to the center. And the reason being is, is that the secondary in a Schmidt is just about that big, but it's a very convex, highly convex surface. So if the star isn't right in the middle, it's on the curve and it's going to throw your whole collimation off. This is a way to get yourself into a real mess. So don't do that. Every time you adjust the secondary screws, move the star back to the center, make another adjustment, move the star back to the center. If you find yourself chasing collimation, in other words, it looks like that little middle diagram is kind of doing this all the way around. And no matter what you do, it won't come to collimation. There's a pretty good chance that your secondary plate has shifted a millimeter or two, or that the secondary was taken out and put back in and not put in exactly correctly and is off a millimeter or two. Either way, you're out of alignment at the front and good luck. Okay, because that's going to mean working with shims and doing some other things. So that's a whole different ball of wax. Doesn't happen very often. Bonus stuff, five minutes, we're done, if that. So I went to Florida for the first time in my life, and like in two months, I'm a senior citizen, so it took a while. So uh, we went to Florida. My wife and I love to do photography, um, wildlife photography, especially. And of course, we do a little bit of astronomy. And um, we went to this place called um, Payne's Prairie. It's just out of Gainesville. It's a huge area right on the interstate. And there's a pier that you can go on and walk out. And you can watch the alligators sail by and the birds there and everything, right? So this alligator was very, very nice. Just came within about 40, 50 feet of me, and I snapped the picture. But when I looked at the eye, if you look, you can see the pier, and you can see the people on the pier. So that's his supper that he's thinking about, which is a little disturbing. But that was us on the pier. So that was kind of cool uh, and a little bit, a little bit freaky. We walked out onto Paints Prairie where it's solid ground. We had a wild horse run right in front of us out of nowhere. Uh, I managed to snap off a couple of shots, so did Janice. It was just so neat to see a really wild horse run right in front of you with his mane flying. It was just great. There were bison, all happy eating whatever it is bison eat on the ground, mostly green things. And uh, they tell you to stay more than 200 feet away um, because they get most unhappy if you get too close. Uh, I would add to that, that when you're as close as you're going to get, don't take your great big telephoto, great big black eyeball that you have and point it at the bull who's watching you very carefully. I speak from experience. <laughs> we actually didn't do that, but it occurred to me it might be a really bad thing. So I would suggest nobody does that. Don't point your cameras at it when you're close enough that the bull is actually taking notice of you. Uh, we saw so many birds. There's a white ibis. They're, they're actually kind of goofy looking, but they fly beautifully. Here's just your regular great blue heron uh, that you would get up here, but that had the biggest fish I've ever seen in a heron's mouth. And it ate the whole thing at once. I could actually see the fish shape going down its neck. It was really also kind of weird. 
but it was so cool. And I'm yelling at Janice, shoot the bird, shoot the bird. So, they, <laughs> so it, was, it was fairly exciting. This is uh, the bird is an anhinga. So think of a cormorant on the big and much faster, uh, much slimmer. It came up out of the water with the fish right in front of us. And I managed to snap a couple of, of shots of it uh, before it could flip it around because they flip it and flip it and flip it and flip it. And occasionally the fish gets away, but not very often. Uh, that is a immature little blue heron. So the adults are all beautiful blue. The young ones are white with grayish blue feathers here and there. A red shouldered hawk that just finished feeding a snake to its baby. These are gorgeous tricolored herons. They were about 30 yards away, 40 yards away. They're just fantastically beautiful birds. These are. Um, um, snowy egrets. So the feet are yellow, the legs are black. That's how you sort of tell them. And they're really fuzzy. So when the wind hits and you can see what happens, they just open. <laughs> they're very pretty, very pretty birds. And wood storks, they have this place called Harris Neck just near Savannah. They have 800 to 1,000 nesting pairs of wood storks. And these birds are ginormous. The wind stands over six feet. Uh, and plus, there's every kind of heron there nesting and every kind of egret. You can imagine there's thousands of birds in front of you as far as you can see. But it's truly an amazing place to be in the spring. My sister-in-law said, can you take a picture of the moon? So I did. <laughs> and one of my, you know, those bucket list things, I got to go to NASA. I got to go to the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, it was suitably awesome. Had a great time. Spent the whole day there. Uh, they have this outdoor rocket park, and uh, they've got Gemini and, and Mercury capsules at top to some of those there. They've got other uh, carry um, uh, commercial payloads. And the background on its side is a Saturn 1B uh, rocket, which looks really big, right? But the Saturn 5 is twice as long as that one. There's the front end of the Saturn 1B. They've got a whole museum just for the space shuttle and for the space station. And out front where Janice is standing there, that is a great big like granite ball on a water bearing that spins around and it's got all the constellations on it. It's really beautiful. And of course, as you walk to the front door, there's the boosters for the shuttle. You can't help but say, wow, you have to say, wow. You go inside, there's a lot of displays. And the Atlantis, the one that was in the very first slide, doing the telescope repair there, that's the one that's on display. I took a picture of all the tiles because they are both famous and infamous. I was just interested to see how it would look underneath there. Two Canada arms on this one with the, the um, halo bay doors open, the business end with all the rockets, very cool. And then you get in a bus and you go to the Apollo Museum. And the actual original, I don't know if it's just the contents of the Apollo mission control is there or if it's the actual mission control that they built around. That wasn't clear to me, but they have all these interactor screens on top and they actually uh, recreate liftoff from T minus two minutes to about T plus two. And when the rockets start, you know, running, the whole building is shaking around you. It's really cool. Uh, and all the consoles are flashing. It's just very, very flashy and fun. And then you walk out a door and you come out underneath the business end of the Saturn V. And this to me, I mean, I dare anybody, anybody to walk out there and not say, holy smokes. Like you just look up, it's enormous. And the rocket goes all the way down the hall. I think it's about 300 feet, I think, something like that. And there's the other end. Uh, with the capsule and the service module and down below is the lunar lander and even though i've been reading and watching stuff about this my whole life that lunar lander was bigger than i imagined i don't know why i didn't think it was that big but it's actually it was impressively large um, and there's a lunar rover and there's a real moon rock you can touch with your fingertip it's very smooth i think more than one or two people touch that moon rock <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, anyway, the Apollo 14 capsules there is kind of neat. Um, 
So war mechanism is, is very intricate. And there's a museum for Mars. Uh, a lot of it is interactive for kids, um, talking about how we're going to colonize Mars at some point. And in the back half is a lot of the actual rovers and such that we've sent to Mars. And, and for some reason, I can't imagine, there's a lot of red in that room. This is like red everywhere. You get it. Anyways, um, so... <laughs> Anyway, so then there's all these rovers in there, and Perseverance, the latest one, is there, and there's a, a, a copy of the helicopter up just mounted near the ceiling. Perseverance is big. Holy smokes, is that thing big? But it was, it was interesting. Neat museum. There were more museums we didn't even get to go in because we were exhausted. That's the end. That was the other night with Chris and Denise. We watched uh, Venus and Mercury over the Grand River. Uh, from Brantford, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Okay. Which of these films is known? Is it known all the time? Okay. <laughs> it's break time. We're going to stretch like the king for a moment or two. Uh, what time have we got? That says 8 minutes to four seconds. Ladies and gentlemen. There we go. I was going to do a deliberate feedback. You want feedback? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at that. All right. So, as per usual, we like giving, giving stuff away here. Um, not me personally, but the club. So, we're going to start off with some books and such. We will be drawing three numbers. We have four prizes. So you get to choose one of the four that are there. First drawn gets first choice. So I will end up taking one item home, which I'll bring back again at another time. So what we have tonight, let me turn this around because I've got to talk sideways. Push that button. There we go. We have Galileo's Daughter. Great book. You read it in two days. Very good book. Um, we have another book about light and how it works and such. Very good, nice pictures in there. The book Orbit from National Geographic. It's a leather bound book. It's impeccable. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And our fourth object for, uh, for beginners, maybe, is a planisphere. Help you find your way around in the sky. All right. So, oh, I guess I need the I need the tickets. Go okay. ahead. Oh, jeez. Okay. I'm going to choose you. Yes, you. We always like to embarrass new people. Yeah, I do that. I love doing that. Blue with your eyes. Yes, this time. Thank you. Oh, hold on, hold on. Hold on, Chris. I think we have to go in here. Yeah, you put the yellow in there. Oh, thank you. That one's mine. <laughs> okay, is that yours? Okay, this one is yours. No. Any blue in there? No. Good. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to draw now. Pop around. Yep, pop around. Last three digits. Luca, who take it? Uh, 132. Come on, your ticket. Okay. 132. Oh, Denise. Hey. Just want to make sure that he has her ticket with her as well. 125. This is true. 
Don't you vibe? No, they went home. One thirty four. Sorry, you said to read wrong? Yeah, you did. Okay. One twenty nine. There we go. Awesome. Okay. It's long there. Okay. Oh, no. We're going to go down to the end. Jessica. Jessica. Everybody, this is Jessica. Hi, 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 Jessica. And I will tell you in my <laughs> Okay, so up next we have Steve with our the sky this month. Too many buttons in here. Um, Steve is our serving director, and he is going to tell us the where what's and who fours and what sits for the next month and reveal to us our challenge, I hope. Okay, Steve, it's all yours. Thanks, Bertie. I'll just find my thing here. What's your screen here? That works. <laughs> so you can see I use a very high tech uh, system for uh, generating title pages. Uh, first, I'm going to start with some pictures of uh, Venus and Mercury that were taken by some of our uh, members. I think uh, Matthew's going to recognize this one. So I'm going to walk over there and try to point out Mercury, which is uh, significantly dimmer than Venus. Actually, I can use the mouse. There's Venus, and Mercury is is this one, right, Matt? Okay, so you can see it's a little dimmer, and it's a lot closer to the horizon. That makes it a challenge. It wasn't our armchair challenge, but it's still a challenge to spot Mercury, and I hope that everybody had a chance because this was a very, very good opportunity. And here's another on a wider angle picture with the uh, uh, Venus again. You can tell these are handheld pictures because Venus doesn't look like a, a press on the wall. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see more of them. And again, we're going to look for Mercury down here somewhere. I can't see it at this angle. Okay, it was right there. <laughs> Okay, so just like all, all astronomy books, the thing you're supposed to look for has two little lines in the sky pointing right at it. Okay, so uh, Mercury didn't actually set until like quarter to 10, but that doesn't mean you could see it the whole way down. Here again, Venus and somewhere in here. Oh, that's not Mercury, really. No, no, it's just Mercury. Oh, wow. It was much brighter as it got later. So uh, the contrast went up, and here's Mercury. So I'm, I am a little bit of a skeptic here. So we've got this tree, and it's about uh, a little bit above the tree. And if we go back to this picture, Mercury was there. So yeah, I was probably going in that direction. <laughs> I, I think he's right. I think it was right about here. Yeah. Okay. Very good, Matt. That's uh, leaving really a lot of light there with your phone. Um, my phone doesn't have a night mode, so now you can see 
Mercury has found its way below the top of this tree. And uh, thanks, Matt, for not moving all over the fields while you were doing it. Uh, so again, Venus looks like a little comet up there, but uh, the Pleiades are just above the horizon, just visible. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Pleiades in a, a bigger picture, I think I have one, you can see they almost look like a little dipper. And sometimes kids will say, that's the little dipper. So you can see all the stars, <clears throat> almost all. Um, I also uh, took the plunge and went looking for uh, Mercury and Venus uh, a couple of nights later. And uh, this is City View Park uh, in Burlington at the top of Kearns Road and Highway 5, looking towards, uh, towards the west. And in this picture, we've got uh, Venus, and I, I'm not even sure if Mercury's in this shot, but we're gonna keep going. And in this one, you can see Mercury was considerably lower in the sky. It's actually here. Oh. No, it's actually here. So I zoomed in. And at some point, that's when my handhold camera made of Mercury while it, uh, uh, how should we say, moved around while I was holding my camera. So kudos to your steady hand. And uh, let's see. And so in this picture, I wanted to get Mercury where I could actually see it. And I think it's down here by the, there, by the telephone pole. And I wanted enough other stars in the sky so that I could go back home and verify it really was Mercury. So there's the belt of Orion up here. And so by looking at a star chart, I was able to uh, verify that really was Mercury. And here's a shot of the Venus near the Pleiades taken by Bob on another night. And uh, you can see so most people can see these two stars, these two stars, and that star, but very few people can separate those two stars with their eyes. So they see six, but not seven stars. And uh, we have uh, a couple of photographs. This one's from uh, Thomas Burke, who um, he has a telescope with a camera eyepiece on it. And it, it's amazing. It'll take uh, a whole bunch of uh, frames. It'll throw away the bad ones, stack the good ones, and uh, give you a real-time view on your phone as it builds it up. And he got the comet here on uh, February 27th. And he also had a good shot of the comet back home. You can get that. You're not going to get the other shot, at least not yet. But there was another shot back from November when the comet was considerably smaller as well. And uh, Thomas, uh, well, I'll mention him again later. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the Messier Marathon. And uh, this is a shot of M77 tonight, when the sun has just set. Oh. I don't see. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so that's that's still April 14th, but it's a different year. There's, there's <laughs> going to be a reason. But I really wanted to emphasize was that by the middle of April, no matter what year you're in, uh, M77 is very low in the sky, and that's when the sun is literally on the horizon. So you are not going to see M77 if you attempt the MCA marathon in April. I think your best best bet would be to try it on like April 1st if that was the new moon. Oh, what a good idea. So, all right, a little bit of uh, history, but the letter M in astronomy is usually short for the word Messier, the name of a comet hunter who lived a long time ago. I don't have it memorized. It's like, what's it, 1780? Okay, roughly 1780. And he would take his 
three or four inch scope and scan the horizon back and forth from downtown Paris, which was candle lit. So considerably less light pollution than we have now. And he would look for comets. And if he found one, he would name it after somebody rich and, and then they would give him a gift. As the case may be, uh, he used to find a lot of things that looked like comets that weren't comets. Because the only way you can verify a comet is, well, either have a really good scope or, which he didn't, or uh, come back tomorrow and look again for the same thing. So he made a list of all the things that might have been comets, but don't move and aren't comets. And it turns out those things are galaxies, supernova remnants, globular clusters, all kinds of really cool stuff to look at if you've got a nice telescope, but not comets. So he made a list of ignore these things, and we flipped it around, look for these things. And so it turns out, though, that by coincidence, there's a part of the sky that doesn't happen to have any of these objects in it. And during the month of March and April, that part of the sky is where the sun is. So the rest of the sky that has all the messy objects uh, can be seen at night. So, so M77 is the one that sets the first. It's the closest to this sort of empty area. And uh, during the, the month of March and April, the sun effectively moves through that area and it gets closer to M77 as it does so. So uh, that's why I call that M77. Is that? Oh, so M77 is called the Phantom Galaxy. It's actually really hard to see, even when you don't have a telescope in the middle of the night. Um, so it, in fact, is a galaxy about 60 million light years away. Okay, so now I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Earth crossing asteroids. And uh, specifically, um, there have been a few in the news recently um, that have come near the Earth and been worth uh, noting, I would say. Um, and the April 13, 2029 is when the asteroid Apophis is going to pass near the Earth. It's going to pass like 20,000 miles from the Earth, which is pretty close in astronomical distances. And uh, that's one of our meeting nights. So I wanted to, in fact, uh, make sure that uh, we would get a good look at it uh, after the meeting. And uh, so I was basically. Who's the fans notice? Yes. <laughs> so in addition <laughs> to the other item that's coming up near the beginning of April, maybe not quite so long from now, there is also a passing asteroid that we will see. And Apophis, uh, when it was discovered, they didn't have very much data. They had seen it a couple of times. They knew it was there. So, 1,100 feet in diameter, so it's a good-sized rock. Uh, and then it was cloudy, just like it happens to us, except more often for us. And basically, they took the data they had, and they ran it through the computer, and they said, this thing's got a 2%, 2% chance of hitting the Earth. And it made the news. And then, of course, they got another, another uh, photograph of it a few days later, and it was a 0% chance. So in the meantime, the math was still not so good. And when it comes in 2029, depending on exactly how close it gets to the Earth, it's going to get deflected by the Earth. And then back in 2036 and 2068, it'll again come near the Earth. And they call it a keyhole. If it had gone through exactly the right spot within that area of uncertainty that we can't compute, it will then be deflected and come back and hit the Earth then. However, uh, a couple of years ago when it came reasonably close, but not like really close, they uh, shined their radars at it and measured its distance to the nearest 50 feet or so and managed to figure out that it's, it's not going to hit in 2068 or 2036. But they couched it in, well, we got 100 years. That's what they said. We don't, we don't have math any good 
beyond 100 years. So it might hit after 100 years, but it's not going to hit for the first 100 years. This thing is actually pretty heavy. It's like 10 billion kilograms. And if you wanted to miss the Earth, you got to give it a push like a millimeter per second. That's actually not that much energy, but a lot of momentum. And since we can't compute it, what I wanted to emphasize with this particular chart, though, this is an asteroid that we found very recently. You can see here the first observation used was March 26, and the last observation used was April 14. This is one of the top, the next five asteroids that are going to go near the Earth. But the key detail is they only found it like three weeks ago. So you don't have a hundred years to get, you know, um, whatever the guy's name is, to go up there and, and drill holes into an asteroid on a spaceship and stuff. You've only got three weeks from the time that you, you see the asteroid to the time that it's basically past the Earth. And during those three weeks, you, uh, well, you know what's coming. <laughs> That's a little bit. So there is a website, I, I mentioned it in the Event Horizon, that, uh, that you can click on uh, back in that issue, and it'll give you basically on any day the next five, five things that are coming. These three, okay, so this thing's only, uh, it doesn't show it there. This thing's not very big. It's like 75 feet in diameter. It's, uh, it's not a planet killer. It'd make a real messier backyard. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, so here they have 33 feet <laughs> and 38 feet in diameter. So they've got a picture of a bus because they don't really have the rock in Gibraltar that they can show you. But and it's going to come only uh, 473,000. I think those are miles uh, from here. So that's that's a pretty like I mean, if the Earth was the size of a dime, that's like I don't know a meter or so away. So your odds of hitting it are like maybe one in ten thousand if you're just throwing things well, at the earth. Well, you know, yeah, but you know, we have three weeks on this, so <laughs> keep that in mind. Bruce Willis, that was the guy I was trying to remember his name. And so, so Apophis, whose name uh, basically means doom, uh, it's going to come by in 2029. And uh, now you can see the reason why I still have the date 2029 sitting there. What I wanted to do was actually figure out on April 13, 2029 at 10 p.m. which way we're going to have to look. But, you know, their, their math on the, their orbit is, is so bad that they've got it actually a million... 1.75 million kilometers from the Earth. This is Stellarium, and that's after the update. So there's going to be better data closer to the time, and we'll, we'll figure it out. So, And it, it shows it as 12th magnitude. I'm pretty sure it's going to be like uh, maybe 7th magnitude, probably by the time we see it. We'll have no trouble picking it up in binoculars, and it should be moving pretty fast. And... Uh, so this is a quotation from uh, Ian O'Neill, the guy who uh, keeps track of all these asteroids. He said it was like uh, the poster child for hazardous asteroids. And so they finally established that they, they've bumped it off 100 years. That's not exactly like out of the question, but I don't know, it makes news. So it says here it'll be 20,000 miles from the planet's surface. You see, then that's not fair. The planet's you know, 4,000 miles in radius. So it's more like 24,000 miles from the center, but we are on the surface. Oh, no. <laughs> That's right. Run. Okay, so um, I did a bit of math, but honestly, I can't say how big a mess it would make. Like, we, we don't know, because if all the energy goes into heating up the rock where it lands, it's not so bad, but if it all goes into blowing that rock into the air and turning it into, you know, dust vapor, then, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, so heavens above shows us that it'll actually be quite, quite visible in the sky at 10 p.m., right about the same place the comet was uh, a couple of months ago. 
And I don't trust this. I don't trust this math yet. And uh, okay, so as armchair astronomers today or this month, I'm challenging you to actually on Earth Day, which is Saturday, April 22nd, when Bernie has generously planned to uh, have a Binbrook uh, observation, to come to Binbrook and actually see what the fuss is about. Here's your chance when <laughs> eight o'clock when everybody turns off their lights to uh, to actually um, not the street lights unfortunately uh, to get a look at the sky and uh, it's a new moon so there will be no distraction from uh, other things and uh, yeah probably a fifty percent chance it'll be cloudy but we'll take it so. So I also wanted to mention the eclipse, which is coming in about one year from now, less than a year. So April 8th, 2024. And uh, speaking from experience, uh, you can see here, this is the uh, one of these eclipse uh, mapping sites. Uh, most important details are the uh, second line from the bottom in the pop-up, which says, this day was cloudy 64% of the time since the year 2000. So, Effectively, there's a 64% chance that there will be a cloud in front of the sun um, when it's important. Um, so, so then I went along the path and I looked all along the path and the best numbers are 47% down in Texas. If you want to go to Mexico, then yeah, 28% cloudy. But anywhere in the, in the United States and Canada, it's your 47% is your best, uh, best odds. Okay, so this year, just, just past, we had a high cloud, thin enough that you can still see the sun through it. Um, so still be observable. Uh, that was after the eclipse time. Prior to the eclipse time, we had clear sky. So Bertie says that he did a dry run on April 8th. He looked out at the uh, time of the eclipse a year later and verified that there were high clouds that were somewhat transparent, and then the clouds set in afterwards. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. And, so. the, and the places that are along the path for 2018, or sorry, for 2024, they were cloudy. All up through Texas and uh, Indiana, et cetera. So we hit the jackpot this year. This year, next yeah. year we're not even going to have free tickets. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Okay, so the one thing I wanted to mention, though, having uh, been clouded out in an eclipse before, is that uh, the closer you are to the center line, at least it will get dark. If you're off at the edge in Hamilton or Binbrook, it won't even get dark when the sun when the sun is in eclipse because literally you've got half the sunlit sky above you full of clouds shining light on everything um, and even I would expect that the sky would be blue around the the solar corona during the eclipse if you're near the edge so I recommend uh, for those who are keen. Uh, <laughs> especially if it's not cloudy, to try to get as close to a uh, place like Port Colburn or, or uh, down towards uh, no the park. center line. No park. What's that? Knoll Park. Knoll Park. Yeah. Do they have good parking? Well, that's good. I speak well. Okay, so then I thought, okay, so suppose it's cloudy here. Well, we'll probably know like a day before. So jump in the car, you know, don't want to, Go through customs. So then I checked up this way over into uh, Quebec. So you can see, like, there's no point driving to Cornwall, okay? It's going to be on the edge of the eclipse anyway. Drive over to Sherbrooke and see see what that is. So they're also calling for, what's that number? 80.5% 80, 80. clouds. So we were only at what 64, so but, you know they're probably independent. So that that's like a, like an eight, eight hour drive, seven hour drive. Well, oh, honestly, at the rate I drive, that would be about a four and three quarter hour drive. 
So, so you gotta, and uh, John actually, John Govro has some stories about uh, Eclipse location modification in haste that uh, that he could tell us sometime. And then I thought, okay, so is there anybody in have in Canada who's going to be happy? And the answer uh, goes all the way over to Newfoundland, and the answer is no. So, seventy percent chance there, uh, more or less, at the edge of Canada, at the middle of the eclipse path. So, so that gives um, us the best chance. So we do have the best best odds here for uh, for uh, totality and and the real real view of the eclipse, which is definitely well worth getting out of your living room for. <laughs> even if it's cloudy, especially if you're near the center line. Okay, so uh, just to, to do some cleanup, there's uh, the May 4th uh, moonrise. It has an azimuth of, uh, what is it, 100, 108.5 degrees. So I recommend uh, getting uh, uh, someplace high. Uh, it's going to actually, if you go to Dunder, it'll rise over Niagara Falls. So you might actually get the uh, the mist of Niagara Falls right in front of the disk of the moon there on the horizon. That would be actually a nice picture. And that's on May the 4th. May the 4th. Cool. And so last month's amateur armchair astronomer challenge was to see planets in the daytime. I'm not going to give up on planets in the daytime. They're just not our challenge anymore. But this is your best shot to see Venus in the daytime. If you look at this, uh, the times I specified here, that's April 23rd. It's a Sunday morning, uh, 9.37. Even I'm awake by then. Um, and you can see that Venus is about three moon diameters ahead of the moon. So you just draw a line from the moon to the sun. You look along that line, stand where the sun is behind a building or the edge of a building so that you don't have the sun in the frame, flip out your binoculars and you're gonna find Venus. And Venus is, uh, is closer earlier in the day, like it starts basically, it rises right beside the moon, but then the moon's only like three degrees above the horizon, it's not worth looking, but you'll see Venus in the daytime. And during the day, it's still going to be there. It'll be a little farther from the moon each hour, and you'll be able to still draw a line and uh, and follow it across the sky. And so this this reminds you of uh, International Astronomy Day, which is actually the 29th of April, and uh, I'm sure we'll have something going on. That's uh, that's uh, the first quarter moon. Yeah, so they've they've given up on astronomy day because clouds hit it more often than they like. So they've got an astronomy week, and I don't know what all the events are or whether there's invited speakers or invited planets. But the, uh... <laughs> those those Earth crossing asteroids are constantly changing, and uh, well worth a look at. And that, that's the end of my talk. Any questions? <laughs> Amen. Awesome. Thank you. Check out those lot. chairs. <laughs> oh, I didn't think Thank you. Here we go. And I'm we got to learn how to do Okay, call in the experts.
So, thank you so very much. Um, I think it's almost time to give away a telescope. What do you think? Should we do yeah. that? Yeah, should we? Yes, I'm sorry. Help. Okay, I was just saying we just picture it. No, no, it's not going to be that hard. <laughs> So, um, let's see. Oh, no, that's no, 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 no
tell me we used to call them keyholes. Yeah, well, we call them keyholes because it used to be, you know, we'd switch the padlock on the gate and stuff. Um, and of course, we have a key. And now it's no longer a keyed entry, it's a, it's a punch code entry. <laughs> so I uh, just now we're calling people gatekeepers. So to borrow from uh, this. Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. That's it. Thank you. I, I had Buster and I'm going, damn Busters. What? <laughs> Zool. Zool. That's it. That's it. So if, if there's somebody or some persons that are interested in maybe once in a while opening up the park for the club, it's not something that you can do and say, hey, buddy, or uh, hey, John, or Bob, we'll, we'll just go up. Uh, no, it's. it's the, the rules are that if we go to the park, we have to make it available to every member. Okay? Not a big deal. I've never had any problem. I don't think anybody's ever had any problem. But please let us know if you might be interested in that. Saying you're interested doesn't automatically mean you're going to get it. No. But whatever night you want, you're any nature. At 11 p.m. or 1 a.m. or whenever, just let us know when you plan to quit. Once, once you get to know your people that regularly come out, um, the access or the access is key to entry, and because of that, I tend to make a, a period of time where I will open the gate. After that, I want to be able to tell us, and I won't give. You're not likely to get in to the park without being there on time. Leaving, however, is at your leisure because I don't have to open the gate for you. The gate will open itself when right. you drive up. Yeah, it's, it's a pressure pad, whatever, and you can leave at your leisure. Once you know who you're dealing with and stuff, yeah, like there's certain people that I know that are well enough, uh, behave enough, that they can stay after I leave. It's up to them. Anyway, that's something for you guys to consider. And uh, in the meantime, tally ho. I know. That was bad. That was just bad. <laughs>